Situated on the Southern Hemisphere, Australia and New Zealand are on the flip side of the globe from the U.S. 26 members from the K-State Master of Agribusiness program journeyed to the land down under to get a better look at Kiwi and Aussie agriculture. New Zealand is often described as one of the prettiest, quirkiest, quaintest, craziest places on earth. A place with beautiful scenery and laid-back friendly people with a love for the outdoors. Frequently greeted by Kia Ora, the Maori word for hello and welcome, New Zealanders were indeed a gracious bunch. Made up of the North and South Islands and a handful of smaller islands, New Zealand is comparable in size to the state of Colorado. Situated where the Pacific and Australian plates meet, it is the youngest country formed due to plate movements and volcanic activity. Mountain ranges and hill country dominate the landscape. The South Island is known for the Southern Alps, glaciers and plains, while the North Island contains the largest lake, active volcanoes and hot springs, geysers and mud pools. It has a population of four and a quarter million people with the majority being of British descent. Approximately 15% of the population belongs to New Zealand's indigenous Maori people, a Polynesian group who arrived around AD 1000. New Zealand is known for its unique variety of wildlife including the flightless kiwi bird, bats, parrots, frogs and reptiles but no native land mammals or snakes. That means there are no rabbits, coyotes, rats, rattlesnakes, and so forth running around the islands. There are, however, Australian possums, which the New Zealanders never appreciate too much since they were kind of an implant from Australia, and they're somewhat of a nuisance. But no large mammals whatsoever. Our trip began in Auckland and spanned from the top of the North Island to the bottom of the South Island, taking in many cities and countryside along the way and eventually ending in Queenstown near the southern tip. Thinking about New Zealand agriculture, New Zealand is sometimes called the world's biggest farm due to an economy based on agriculture and horticulture. However, over the last decade, more than a million hectares of New Zealand's countryside have moved from pastoral farming to alternatives such as grapes, olives, avocados, forestry and lifestyle farms. Meat, dairy products and wool, however, still remain among New Zealand's major overseas exports, with dairying contributing around 23% of the country's annual export income. Other principal exports are forest products, machinery, fruit, and fish. New Zealand is the largest dairy exporter in the world and the eighth largest milk producer. There are approximately 13,000 dairy farms with more than 5.2 million dairy cattle. The number of farms has decreased while the average herd sizes have been on the increase over the past 20 years much like in other parts of the developed world, such as the U.S. More than one-third of New Zealand dairy herds are milked by what are referred to as share milkers, where individuals own and milk the cows using equipment and land owned by another. Dairy companies produce close to 15 billion liters of milk annually, with 95% of it processed for export. Ban Lee Dairy is one of the leading dairies in New Zealand, milking 1,250 cows twice daily year-round on a carousel-style milking parlor. They won the 2007 Dairy Business of the Year Award in the High Input category. Their herd is fed annually a 50-50 split between pasture and supplement blend of corn silage, palm kernel, potato byproducts, and canola. 
They grow their own corn, and that's referred to as maize in New Zealand, of course, uh, for use in their feed, making them a little unique compared to other New Zealand dairies, which are mostly 100% pasture fed. Ben Lee milk is picked up once a day by Fonterra tankers for processing. Fonterra is the world's leading exporter of dairy products and responsible for more than a third of international dairy trade. We visited their Research and Innovation Center in Palmerston North to learn more about the dairy industry giant. With close to 11,000 shareholders, they export 95% of New Zealand made dairy products to customers in more than 140 countries. In 2009, they collected 14 billion liters of milk from cooperative members, processing an average of 70 million liters of milk per day. Well, beef's important too. To New Zealand, beef cattle numbers have been holding around 4.4 million, with the majority of cattle found on the North Island. Bulls and steers are generally finished or fattened, as we would say, on pasture at 18 to 24 months of age at a carcass weight of about 650 pounds, while heifers are typically finished at about 500 to 550 pounds as a carcass weight. More than 50% of the beef is exported to the U.S., with North Asia being the second largest beef market for New Zealand beef products. Unlike the U.S., where cattle are finished in feedlots, dairy and beef cattle, as well as sheep and deer, are generally finished on pasture, usually ryegrass and white clover. Livestock are moved through a series of paddocks to ensure enough to eat throughout the year. To get a glimpse of the finishing side of sheep and beef production, we toured the straw hand finishing property. The straw hands farm 500 hectares where they finish 13,000 lambs and 1,200 cattle. Their herds are all pasture fed and rotate around paddocks to keep fresh grass available. They also grow some peas, wheat, and barley. I might add that much of the grassland in New Zealand is highly productive, it tends to have crop inputs such as fertilizers placed, uh, has a value often of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars an acre, so it's actually a fairly productive kind of land even though it happens to be raising perennials such as grasses. Probably New Zealand's best known statistic is the ratio of sheep to people. 40 million sheep to 4.25 million people. However, in the last two decades, the sheep population has declined more than 20%, bringing them to their lowest level since 1950. The main reason for the declining sheep population is ongoing conversion of land to other enterprises, for example, deer farming, forestry, and dairy. And it is also due to drought conditions over the last several years. However, even with the decline in sheep numbers, sheep farming is still a major industry in New Zealand. Rangitiki CMP Meat Processing Facility is a state-of-the-art lamb processing facility on the North Island. It is also the newest processing facility built in New Zealand. They can process four and a half lamb carcasses per minute or more than 900,000 per year. CMP purchases their lambs through a third-party procurement procedure. They specialize in chilled, boneless cuts, mainly bound for the UK and Japan. The managing director explained CMP invested in an automated chiller as chilling creates more aging and tenderness in the finished product as compared to freezing. So this indicated a high degree of innovation to develop a product that would export at a higher price. Glenadine Station near Lake Oia on the South Island runs thousands of fine wooled merino sheep, as well as Hereford cattle and deer. 
Jerry Burton and his family have been producing a fine, bright, high quality and quantity of wool. Sheep are shorn once a year, with most of their wool going to an auction market. They are developing a new breed of merino called the Fine Merino Composite. Jerry and his staff showed us examples of their wool, which comes off the sheep in one large piece, referred to as a fleece. Um, so this is quite a nice, you can see tonight how, how nice and bright it is, and you can see the crimp in the wool there, see the crimp in the wool there? So the crimp in the wool is very important for the processing, as it's part of the, um, gives it its elasticity in the, in the wool, and uh, it just creates that bit of extra character. They also conducted a sheep herding demonstration with their dogs Spot and Luke. The herding dogs respond to voice commands to steer the sheep in the right direction or round up any straggler. A good header dog like Spot can cost two to three thousand dollars. Might also even backtrack talking about the sheep dogs. The sheep dogs are herding dogs not guard dog. Remember, sheep have no natural enemy in New Zealand. That's one of the reasons that they have flourished there. Introduced in New Zealand in the 1800s by Captain James Cook, deer had no natural enemy. Remember, no predatory land mammals, and so they flourished. By the 1950s, they were becoming a problem, however the deer that is, and the government began employing helicopters to shoot and capture the wild deer. New Zealand is now the world's largest producer and exporter of venison. Venison production in New Zealand is currently around 23,000 metric tons, of which 90% is exported. Most of the venison is exported to Europe, with half of it going to Germany. Antler velvet harvesting is also increasing in New Zealand, with the velvet exported to Korea and other Asian countries. There it is used as an aphrodisiac and as a medicinal remedy. Of course, being a specialty product with the velvet, the market tends to go up and down, and so visiting with people involved in velvet production, uh, we see that uh, the profitability is somewhat variable. A former deer shooter and share milker, Murray Matushka, now owns a deer farm near Taupo on the North Island. We stopped by to get a look at a deer farming operation. He stocks more than 850 deer, which are a mix of red deer mated to elk to create a larger carcass. Murray farms red deer for venison and antler velvet. It was interesting to watch the deer run through their paddocks. When they reached the fence, they turned around and went back the other direction. This was quite unusual to see as we're kind of used to deer jumping the fence and continuing along their way. On a side note, more than a deer farmer, it seems Murray is quite a collector. He also has zebra, several types of trophy deer and elk, birds, all kinds of animals on his property, basically. Also an artist, Murray is known for his animal paintings and, and sculptures, which can be found all over New Zealand. At Glenadine Station, Jerry Burden has put up a considerable amount of deer fencing. They have found that deer do well in the hilly countryside, where they have previously run merino ewes. The Burdens raise deer for venison and antler velvet, and one growing facet of the deer farming industry, hunting for trophy bucks. They provide opportunities for hunters to take down prize bucks. This type of diversification has helped sustain the sheep farm and wool production, which is now only 20% of their farm's income. Kiwi fruit production has been increasing over the last 10 years and was up to 13,250 hectares in 2007. 
We stopped at an organic kiwi farm to learn more about this fruit that has the same name as the nickname of the people themselves in New Zealand and the same name as, of course, the national bird, the kiwi. Cocoa Trust Kiwi Fruit Orchard is a family-owned operation. They grow 10.8 hectares of green kiwi and 1.8 hectare of zespri gold kiwi. Both types of kiwi are grown on a canopy of vines. It was neat to see the fruit still waiting to be harvested. Kiwi fruit are graded on the fruit's shape, number, and color of seeds. Mr. Oliver, the owner of the farm, told us to receive high-quality marks the fruit must contain around 1,000 black seeds. Every kiwi is hand-picked. We also learned that the bees used to pollinate the kiwi fruit blooms do not like kiwi, so they are tricked into pollinating the buds. That is, beehives are located near the canopy seeded with apples. The apples draw the bees and eventually they cannot tell the two fruits apart. Other important sectors of the agriculture industry in New Zealand are wine grapes, apples, crops and vegetables. Grape vines can be seen more and more around the country. Although wine has been produced in New Zealand for 150 years, the growth of the wine industry has been most dramatic in the last 20 years. A variety of wines are produced, including Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay, but New Zealand has become best known for its Sauvignon Blanc. The Maori people are thought to have migrated from islands near Hawaii hundreds of years ago. Their culture is vibrant and a large part of New Zealand. Tiki totems are common around the islands and are meant to bring good luck. We were treated to a traditional Maori dinner and were entertained by the group singing, dancing and war poses. Several members of our tour group had the opportunity to try their dancing skills. We also had the opportunity to view some of the volcanic activity of the Teipua thermal area at Rotorua. We saw boiling mud pools, steaming lakes, and geysers. After a week in New Zealand, we were on to Australia. The dusty outback, kangaroos, and the Sydney Opera House are what most people picture when thinking about Australia. Well, it has all of these, but so much more. The sixth largest country in size, Australia is about the size of the U.S., but only 21 million people call it home. And more than 90% of Australia's population can be found along the coast because much of the inland is harsh outback country. The vastness of the country and the variety of its people make it a unique place to visit. Our journey took us along the eastern coast from Canberra to Brisbane. 40% of land in Australia has no agricultural value but agriculture still ranks as Australia's second major export industry. Land in the states of Western Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria provides soils and climates suited to a variety of agricultural production from an open range grazing and cereal cropping to irrigated pastures and horticulture 
orchards and vineyards. Wheat, wool, beef, and lamb are the main products. Water, or the lack of it, remains one of the biggest concerns for the agriculture industry. Australia has been in a severe drought since 1992, although I'll note it did appear to be lifting when we were there in 2010. In 2007, the drought was classified as one of the worst ever. Major reservoirs had depleted and emergency water procedures had been put in place. Producers vie for irrigation water rights and look for ways to store or conserve water that is available. Many cropping operations rely on drilled wells, referred to there as boreholes, to reach water in underground basins and it is common to see ditches built to funnel rainwater into holding tanks for later irrigation use. The holding tanks are actually berms of soil put up to make small ponds. They refer to those as holding tanks. The beef industry is the biggest agricultural enterprise in Australia. Angus is the number one breed of cattle in Australia. Dependent upon export markets, over 60% of Australian beef is exported, primarily to the United States and Japan. The industry has benefited from the discovery of BSE, also known as mad cow disease, in Canada, Japan, and the United States, as Australia is free of that disease. Like New Zealand, most beef finishing takes place on grass, but we stopped at the Curry beef feedlot. The property is 350,000 acres divided into 60 to 70 acre paddocks where cattle are run before being brought into the feedlot. Manager Jim Cudmore explained Kerwee as part of a vertically integrated operation taking cattle through the feedlot and meat processing facility to supply beef to domestic and export markets. The 15,000 head feedlot also contains some Wagyu cross cattle specifically for export to Japan. Wagyu cross cattle are finished to carcass weights of 800 to 900 pounds. Kerwe mills its own feed on the property. The mix usually includes sorghum, wheat, sunflower meal, molasses, and palm oil or sunflower canola oil blend. The blend does not include corn because there is not enough corn available. Kerwe supplies grass-fed beef products to 84 countries around the world. Lamb has become an increasingly important product as the sheep industry has moved its focus from wool production to the production of prime lamb. I'm talking about as a meat now. However, wool is still a big part of the industry as well. There are currently 80 million sheep in Australia, 50 million of which are merino sheep. The Australian wool industry is widely recognized as producing some of the finest quality merino wool. This is largely attributable to selective breeding and, and a superior genetic line. The merino sheep was an interesting animal because it was, it was bred to have a lot of folds on its skin that allowed for a lot more volume of wool production because every fold gave more surface area from which to grow wool. At the John Dairy and Wool Shed, we enjoyed a traditional Aussie bush lunch, including of course lamb chops and potatoes. Built in 1859, it is the oldest working wool shed in Queensland. After lunch, we toured the grounds, which include an old schoolhouse, post office, barns, antique farming equipment, a blacksmith shed, and more. We also were treated to a sheep shearing demonstration. Our guide sheared that sheep in less than two minutes. The sheep appeared as a rag doll, basically allowing the shearer to bend and twist him 
as necessary to get every last inch of wool removed. Australia also produces a considerable amount of cotton. One crop is grown during the season from October to April. It typically is a, a GMO crop, that's a genetically modified crop, so as to prevent grubs and weeds. Most Australian cotton goes to China, Indonesia, South Korea, Japan, and Thailand. The largest crop of 3.5 million tons was in 2001. But as we heard from almost everyone we met during the, our trip, water is an important issue for the cotton industry. By 2008, the drought was taking its toll and resulted in the smallest crop ever at less than three quarter million tons. 2009 was a little better as production approached 1.6 million tons. 90% of the cotton fields are irrigated, due partly to this historical drought. The heart of the Darling Downs, west of Brisbane, which is some of the best farming land in Australia, with thick black soils, we stopped at Cowan. Cowan is mainly a cotton operation, but they also grow wheat, corn, sorghum, and chickpeas where there is enough water available. We dropped by one of their fields to observe the cotton being harvested. Their average yield, we're told, is around four bales an acre. Notice that's an acre, not per hectare. Some other sectors of the agriculture industry include aquaculture and horticulture. Charix Park is one of the biggest freshwater crayfish farms in Queensland. They raise red claw crayfish, which are native to rivers in northern Australia. The average size for an adult male is 120 to 150 grams. At Cherex, they can ship crayfish live or frozen, depending upon the customer's preference. They have shipped to the US, the UK, and Malaysia. Presently, however, the crayfish are costing more to raise than they can sell them for, and so the farm also runs cattle to supplement income. But it certainly remains committed to the crayfish operation. Which This brings up an interesting point about all of Australia and New Zealand. Almost every farming operation we talked to was directly tied to the export market. Unlike, say, in the U.S., where even when our products are exported, we often don't know the necessary connections. In this case, the farmers almost always have direct connections with their end buyer. We also learned in Australia that vegetable farmers have better yields by planting seedlings rather than seeds themselves directly into the ground. Withcott Seedlings is a major supplier of vegetable seedlings for the east coast of Australia. They produce more than 420 million seedlings per year, and their products include tomato, broccoli, lettuce, asparagus, rock melon, watermelon, seedless watermelon, cauliflower, pumpkin, chili, parsley, celery, and echinacea. We took a tour of the greenhouses, seed storage, planting operations. Their seeds range in price from $50 to $500 per thousand seedlings, depending upon the type of seed. They use a soilless mixture for seedlings, so no dirt is involved, preventing any contamination. Young backpackers from Australia, New Zealand, and Europe, as well as immigrants from African countries, especially Nigeria, are commonly hired by producers to actually place the seedlings into the ground during the planting process. From Withcott, we were on to Emaho Trees, which is a wholesale export nursery joint venture of Birkdale Nursery. Their first major international project was Hong Kong Disneyland in 2001, where they helped design the landscaping and supplied the trees, shrubs, and grasses. Since then, they have established nurseries in China, Hong Kong, Macau, and Abu Dhabi, providing 
landscape architects, developers, contractors, and governments with a variety of trees, palms, shrubs, and turf. Most trees are in the ground at a nursery for five years. Property manager Nigel gave us a demonstration on how trees are dug up and replanted using a tree spade. It's worth noting that trees in this part of the world, because of the growing season, tend to grow considerably faster than they do in the U.S. A faster turnaround of trees in a nursery in Australia than we would in the U.S. Well, we took in many sites during the two-week trip. In New Zealand, we saw beautiful countryside and toured several cities, including Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, and Queenstown. In Queenstown, we rode to the top of Bob's Peak for a view of the city at night. In Australia, after a lunch cruise on the harbor in Sydney, we saw the Sydney Opera House. Beautiful building, mainstay for Australia. We also struck Australia's Parliament House and the War Memorial in Canberra, the capital city, Bondi Beach, and the Sunshine Coast. The trip would not have been complete without the occasional sighting of a wild kangaroo, wallaby, colorful parrot, or kapala. In keeping with the spirit of the trip, we dined on much lamb fixed in a variety of methods, all of it was delicious. We also had the opportunity to sample Australian beef to see how their grass-fed steaks compared to our grain-fed steaks in the U.S. But the highlight of the trip was probably the farm stays. Our large group was broken into smaller groups and each was assigned to a different lo local farm family for one night. Each group got the opportunity to spend quality time with the family and learn about their farming and agritourism operation. With only two weeks to spend in two countries, we saw a great deal, but only scratched the surface of the land down under. Cheers, mate. <laughs>